Hey, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and pray one more time. Oh, Father God, thank you for... Oh no! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do this old school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's really dark downstairs. Does <laughs> 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 anybody need to go check on the kids? Somebody yeah. go to our <laughs> 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 All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, this building. Thank you for this church family that we can come together and study your word in the dark or in the light. Uh, just ask that you uh, focus us, quiet us, and give us peace in the midst of uh, studying a, a passage of scripture that, that some would find frightening. But as the one who wrote it did, we, we ask that we might rejoice and have peace through it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Can you can all learn in the dark? All right. It's too dark. It's too dark to hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, I went back, I'm going to break a couple of rules of preaching. First of all, you're not supposed to preach an entire book in 20 minutes, and I'm going to try and do that. And second of all, you're not supposed to change your subjects three times the night before, and I did that. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna. I'm just gonna take you through my favorite minor prophet, Habakkuk, uh, and he is he. He's a guy who we don't know a whole lot about. It's part of why I like him. There's a little bit of mystery around him. But we're gonna read what he what he did, and we'll talk a little bit about about uh, what he had to deal with, what word he got from God and how he responded to it. So if you want to turn to Habakkuk, we're going to start in chapter 1. And the outline for this sermon is three hows. First, how long, O God? Second, how come, O God? And third, how great is our God? And Habakkuk, his name means embrace, or somebody to say wrestle. And they say wrestle because that's sort of what Habakkuk does throughout this whole book. He's wrestling with God, trying to come, with, come to grips with the news that God has for him. And it's a little bit frightening. And so the first, first is him crying out, how long? Second is him asking, how come? Why is this your answer? And the third is him coming to the conclusion that what God says is good. And he's going to trust in the Lord. So hopefully we'll see that as we go through the text. But start in chapter 1, verse 1, if you can read it. Uh, I'll try and read it loud for you. It's the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked <coughs> surround the righteous so justice goes forth perverted. A little bit of context so we understand what Habakkuk is talking about. He is living before, if you, if you know your history of Israel, you've got the kings, and then you've got the exile, where, where God takes them into Babylon for punishment for their idolatry. And then they're right before the exile here. They're in the midst of idolatry. Habakkuk is living in Judah, and the king is worshiping Baal, He's worshiping these false gods, he's bowing down to idols and committing all sorts of atrocities that just are, are against God and his word. And this is the culture. Everything around him is all pointed towards not God. When they have the law, when they have the word of God, when they know the true God, they're supposed to be worshiping God and they are worshiping anything but 
And so he's crying out to God, how long shall I cry for help when you will not hear, cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look idly at wrong? Why, why is all this going on in Israel? Why are all these people worshiping these false idols, and you're not doing anything about it? Why are you waiting so long to correct this wrong? Where's the justice? When are you going to come and fix this problem in Israel that they're not worshiping you, they're worshiping something else? That's what he's crying out to God about. He's looking at this culture around him, and he can't believe that God is letting this go unchecked. And the answer comes from God in verse 5. And to summarize the answer that God gives, the answer is, oh, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to send in the Babylonians, and they're going to kill everyone. And anyone they don't kill, they're going to take into exile. That's going to be my answer to this problem that's going on. He says in verse 5, God is talking back to Habakkuk, and he says, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwelling not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome, and their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. He goes on describing the might and the power and the crushing devastation that accompanies the Babylonians wherever they go. He's saying, I'm going to send Babylon, and they're going to judge Israel for me. That's my answer to you, Habakkuk. All of the iniquity you see, it's going to be dealt with, and everyone's going to pay. And so Habakkuk gets this word, and the, the end of chapter 1, starting in verse 12, is, is sort of a, a uh, come again? You're, you're saying that the Babylonians are going to come in and kill everyone for this iniquity? They're, going to, they're just going to run roughshod over the entire city and destroy and crush? And what about those of us who are good? What about those of us like, like me, God, who is following your law, who is your prophet? Uh, he says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. You, O Lord, have ordained them as judge, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he? So what he's saying there is, is the, what about the righteous who are amongst the wicked? Why, why do you idly look at the traitors and remain silent when the wicked are swallowed up by men more righteous than me. And then in verse 14, he kind of gets into this, uh, how are you going to separate out the righteous and the, the unrighteous? How are you going to, to keep the Babylonians from killing the good guys who are in Israel still? You, uh, verse 14, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things you have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. He's... What about like what the, the, the fish analogy? You're bringing up all of the fish together. You're going to catch them all up, judge them all together. How are you going to separate them out? What about us good guys who are mixed in with all these bad guys who are idolatrous? That's his sort of uh, his how come. Why is this how you're doing it? And chapter 2 is, is Habakkuk sort of resolve. I will take my stand at my watch post, station myself on the tower, look out and see what he will say to me. I'm going to wait and see what God's response is to this question that I have for him. How is he going to deal with this? And the answer comes in the rest of chapter 2. It's God's second response. He says to Habakkuk, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he who reads it may run. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end, it will not lie, if it seems slow, wait on it, it will surely come, it will not delay. Verse 4, chapter 2, Behold, his soul is puffed up and is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. And that verse is one that is quoted four times in the New Testament, one of the most quoted verses in the Old Testament. The righteous shall live by his faith. That's God's answer. And if you think through this with me, uh, Habakkuk is sitting there going, I'm, I'm still not getting it. The righteous is going to live by his faith. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, and I think what God means is, yeah, you might die, but you're going to be resurrected. By faith, the righteous will live. 
That might be the word that he's giving to Habakkuk. It might be, you're just going to have to deal with this, Habakkuk. I've got you in the end, in the long run. When we get to the new Jerusalem, there's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more sadness. There will be in this life. There will be things that you can't control and that you can't fight, and there will be pain that you don't want to have to deal with, like the Babylonians coming. But by faith, the righteous will live with me together, reunited in peace in the New Jerusalem. The other option, which I think is perfectly reasonable uh, and is a little bit more palatable, is that he's saying, look, do you trust me or not? I'm, I'm going to keep the Babylonians from taking out the, the righteous among the wicked. I just don't think that's, that's the right interpretation based on chapter 1. But uh, it's, it's an option. I'll leave it at that. The rest of chapter 2 is God going on and explaining just how devastating it's going to be again. And he's, he goes with all of these woe pronouncements. Uh, every four verses he says, woe to this person, woe to that person, woe to this person. All of these different sins that Israel is guilty of. Woe to him, woe to him, woe to him. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a funeral cry. That, that woe to him, that's a common thing that back then, that, that's what you would cry over a funeral. Woe to the man who just died. And it's this, this pronouncement of woe on Israel. Woe to him who will be taken out by Babylon for his sins. And so this is that, that chapter 2 and chapter, or the, the rest of chapter 2 is, is that how come, oh God, how, how come this is the answer? And him sort of explaining it. Uh, and then chapter 3 is, is, is the best chapter. We, we get to see Habakkuk just struggle with this and come to his conclusion. And so I wanted to read all of chapter 3, and I want you to close your eyes and, and think through some of the imagery that Habakkuk is bringing up in this psalm, this song that he's singing to God. He's talking about the history of Israel and how God has provided no. through things like the flood and how he created and he's fought off so, so many enemies. And then uh, I'll, I'll let you know when to open your eyes again, but just try and picture some of these things that Habakkuk is bringing up in this song to God as he deals with this answer. O oh Lord, I have heard of the report of you and your works. O oh Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Haran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from his hands. And there he veiled his power. Before him with pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. The earth, the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. And curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, your indignation against the seas, when you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers and mountains. You saw writhed, and raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury, you threshed the nations in anger, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrow the head of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. Rejoice! as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I heard, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people <coughs> who invade us. And this is where we really hear his resolve. Verse 17, 
Though the fig trees should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olive fail, and the field yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God who saves me. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And that's where I kind of want to focus in on. The, chapter 3 is all of the how great is our God. And verses 17 through 18 is where we really hear the trust. We heard him describe these terrifying things that God has done. Sweeping through different uh, war imagery. Things with the raging horses trampling down. And you can go ahead and open your eyes. Verse 17, though the figs should not blossom nor fruit beyond the vines. He's describing even if in those situations when we feel low or we feel weak or there isn't much abundance, when it seems like God has abandoned us from our perspective, when, when we're struggling with our finances, when we don't have the health that we want, he describes it here with, with agriculture terms, right? The fig not blossom, there's no fruit, there's no olives to make uh, oil, there's no food in the fields, there's no flocks. Yet, in those situations, what is his response? I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation, the God who saves me. Even in the lowest of times, we know that God is who he says he is. He says that he is good and that he saves. And that is what our faith is. That is what our hope is. We believe that God is who he says he is and that he saves. We can rejoice in the hard times because God has good times coming. And it might be after this life is over. Like we were talking about, when, this, when the shadows of this life are gone, I'll fly away to a land on God's celestial shore. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. That is the hope. And I, I have to share this, this uh, story. Yesterday, a group of us climbed school marks. And... Uh, but there were six of us going, and one of our buddies, Nathan, uh, he, he back there waving. He uh, he had a little bit more trouble, uh, and so he said, "Go on, I'm gonna enjoy the views. Like I'm gonna go my own pace." And I, I I've been in that situation where I wanted the group to just go ahead of me so I could I could go my own. So I was like, "All right, we're gonna take him at his word, and uh, we'll we'll make sure we can see him, but we'll let him go his own pace." And uh, he got up to the rocky part, and the rest of us were on the top waiting, and we're waiting, and we don't see him, and eventually I hear him cry, crying out, hey guys, I'm, I, I'm ready to go back down. <laughs> <laughs> he's right over the, like, we know he's right there, but he's not coming up. So, uh, all right, we're going to come around the back, and we'll come and, and catch you, and and we'll, we'll go down together. Uh, he's a little bit higher up than we, than we thought. So I, I cut across, and I'm, I'm, I'm there, and I get to him, and he is frightened. Uh, he, he's got himself in that situation where he's like, I don't know how I got up this high, and I don't know how I'm going to get down. <laughs> I can't go up, and I can't go down. What do I do? And he needed somebody there. Uh, he's, an able, he's an able guy. Nathan can take care of himself. But he needed somebody to just guide his feet down and talk him down. You got, a, you got a spot right there under your left foot, down down about, about six inches. You'll have a foothold, all right? Right foot, take it down here. And, and we just talked him down off that rocky part. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the group went on. It was me and Nathan working down the mountain until we got to a place where we were on level ground. And then uh, <laughs> we were taking deer paths across the side of the mountain to get back to, to the ridge to get, get down to school, Marvin. The rest of the group was down, down on the base, and I'm sitting there walking along the deer pass, and I go, I finally understand this version of Habakkuk. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. They, 
They're just prancing up those paths. And we're sitting there trudging. <laughs> when you have that, that rejoice, that faith, that trust that God is good, even in the, in the terrible times, uh, he, ma he makes our feet like the deer's. We can just prance up those paths. We can be confident in expectation. At one point, Nathan, uh, he, was, he was getting worried and uh, getting a little anxious. And at one point he said, my goodness, God is good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what he needed to say. <laughs> that is the hope. That is the faith. That is what we need. That, that is what our faith is in. It is in the goodness of God that he will pre provide even when we're scared, even when we don't know how we're going to get down off this cliff. He's in control. And even if we had plunged to our deaths that day, we would have gone knowing that God was in control. And that is what our faith is as Christians. We believe that God is who he says he is, that he is good, and that he will provide. He makes our feet like the deers, and he makes us tread on high places. We can get up to the top of school alarm and just take it in. And that will be the new Jerusalem, and that is what our hope is. So, the next time you're reading the prophet Habakkuk, remember, how long, how come, and above all, how great is our God? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this word, for this, this man, Habakkuk, who struggled with a difficult word from you and came out faithful in the end. And uh, let us do the same. Let us trust in you in the good times and in the bad. Help us to be content when we are hungry, when we are well fed, knowing that Christ is our salvation. Always, always, Father, let your will be done above all else. And it's in your Son's name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, Josh is going to play his guitar quietly and sing really loud. Ross is on the quiet guitar. Am I on? There's no power. Yeah, yeah, you're on. I want to say, you know, I don't think Steve.